welcome to Association Transformation. We have been quite international lately, so I'm so excited to have a guest that's just down the street from me. It's, it's sad we can't be recording in the same room yet, but first I will welcome my co-host, Mr. Andrew Chamberlain. Hello. As you take a drink of coffee, can you chime in and say hello first? It's it's not coffee, because it's... Oh, it's, stop. it's... <laughs> You've been blowing on that mug the entire time, or have you been pretending? It's, it's all just—it's all just for show. It's all just for show. It's <laughs> oh your finest. God. It's just a pint of uh, of whiskey. I'm just, you know, getting through all the right. day. Yeah. No. Hi. Well, again, I'm I'm glad you brought your professionalism back to the podcast. Thank always. You for, thank you always. for joining us. Um, as you know, Association Transformation is the international conversation of everything association. We are advancing innovations, having the difficult conversations, and pushing things beyond the average, normal, boring association podcast. This is Association Transformation, and I'm excited to uh, partner with Consort Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions on behalf of the Institute of Association Leadership. So I've checked off all the sponsors, so now we can jump in. Um, and Andrew, to be serious, I'm actually kind of embarrassed we haven't had this conversation more often, earlier, and, and more frequently. And, you know, I'll admit, we talked about it. We didn't know how to have it. We didn't know how to have it correctly. We didn't know how to have it in a responsible way. So I I wholly admit that. And it's not that we aren't interested or passionate or fully aware of the necessity of this, um, but we didn't know how to tackle it. And I'm guessing that we are somewhat similar to a lot of association executives and boards and staff who, who don't know how to start, who don't know how to start in the right way. And... You know, for that, I'm so excited that, you know, again, down the street from, from me um, here in the uh, the 202-517 Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. Oh, my God, D. you're giving suburbs. people your address? My God, just no, stop. No, those, those are our area codes. You, <laughs> never mind. You don't understand. Um, again, I'm trying to intro here. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Miss Sharon Newport. Thank you so much for joining us and already having put up with our with our banter. We we so appreciate you uh, you joining us today. And uh, I'll let you introduce yourself. But first off, we we are ready and we have the right person with us to to have uh, an appropriate and responsible and relevant conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And thank you so much for being here with us. Tell us where you where you are, who you are, and uh, and how you come to this conversation. Well, thank you for having me. It's so good to be with you all today. So um, I am an association executive who had a prior life in documentary television and film. I actually have my undergraduate degree as a professionally trained actor from an acting conservatory and been in New York and LA and came back to DC to do documentary and fell right into associations like a lot of us who didn't know it existed. Seems like a logical trans it seems like a logical oh, yeah. journey for me, it's, actually. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, no, it was a straight linear line. You know, it's so funny. Um <clears throat> I will say, speaking of, of diversity, um I, my career has always been focused on I have a passion for people learning about each other through the experience of each other in order to collectively and collaboratively do things in the world, make an impact in the world. And so as an 18 year old going to college, that's the talent I knew I had at the time. I knew I was a good actor. I knew I loved telling stories and I knew I was passionate about truth. And that easily weaves its way into, I get to LA, I meet people, they're giving me jobs and one of them becomes a producer, has their own company, gets a book deal and um, is getting a talk show deal and telling stories and telling truths. And in that process, they got interviewed for a documentary. And then that film company said, hey, could you work for us on the side? Would you do some things? And I end up doing a film um, about America's unhealthy obsession with beauty. And I ended up as a co-producer on that film. I got hooked. I started to learn about post-production to be more skilled around that. Started to leave the acting behind, moved into this world. I go into documentary TV when it comes to DC with Discovery Channel. And um, I loved it, but I also burnt out. <laughs> I just burnt out, right? I just was working 24-7 uh, international production. I was based in DC, but working in every time zone all days of the week. And I just said, oh, I need a break. I was a contractor. Um, there's this job down the street at this um, institute, association kind of thing. I don't know what it is, but it looks like they want a production manager. I can produce pretty much anything. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go learn this new world and try it out for a second. And then 12 years later, I become the interim CEO of that association and the foundation. And 
um, am ready for my next transition. So I've actually transitioned out of that as of just a few weeks ago and handed the reins to a fine executive who is now running that association and foundation. And I'm working on my own and consulting. Um, along the way, I went back to school, learned some things, and really pretty passionate about system and the power of system, just like we do in associations, the power of community, um, but looking to create impact in multiple places in multiple ways and supporting the leader and the executive around that. And with that comes the lenses of DEI. And so with that is just kind of a natural transition and iteration in, in what I do. And the bigger level of system, the more excited I get. So um, I'm glad to be with you all today to talk more about this, because you're right, Elisa. I mean, uh, to start with the, the humble perspective is powerful, and I appreciate the honesty. A lot of people don't know how to have this conversation. And I, I'd like to think what I will model for us today, but also will all exemplify in our conversation is that starting somewhere is what matters. And it's perhaps a little more accessible to all of us, particularly from a leadership lens than we may have imagined in terms of just getting started, right? You don't have to be perfect. Leaders start off and they're not perfect either. <laughs> and so we all learn as we go on the journey. No, thank you so much. Are you looking for to be a podcast co-host? I mean, I might have an opening because I'm you know, so impressed right this. here off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> I do love this work. I do love this work. And I love your banter, so I can't interrupt that. I'll have to just oh, okay. come up with my own. We're my not own having any more banter. It's done, though. <gasps> I'm finished oh, with the banter. Okay, he's, he's pouting. He's pouting. All right, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. But, you know, you, you say that the, the first step is the most important one and, and we're in a progress over perfection situation. Any organization, and you know, I, I speak from the American Association perspective. Um, any any association leader, executive, staff person that doesn't know that this is in the in the dialogue or should be in the dialogue, you know, that that that's a different problem. That that tone deaf <laughs> issue is is a different one. But someone who knows that this is there, someone who hears it percolating up amongst the membership or amongst the staff. What's, what's the best way to start? What's the, I mean, how, how do you begin? How do you begin this? Whether uh, I just, you know, wrapping your arms around it, we all, we watch the news, we all hear organizations having great successes or other organizations having great, great uh, setbacks. How do you begin? Yeah. I, there might be a lot of opinions on this. My opinion is that from a leadership lens, like anything that's going on in the environment or in the world or in our association's community that the association is maybe not yet addressing, the leader has to get their own education. And so depending on that person's life experience or their background or their own, you know, um, Maybe they've got some learning that they've done for one reason or another. Maybe they're part of things in their community, but you have to get your, you have to be responsible for your own education. And um, I don't think there's one way to do it. I think one of the things that often people in this moment would want is like, what are the things that I can check off a list to know that I got it done and I'm, I'm on the path and like leadership, it doesn't quite work that way. And it's about what you do and not what you, say you're doing <laughs> right and so um i i think it, it has to come down to the personal individual leader learning about the work what's going on in their community i think listening um is a good start to kind of go okay what are my members saying what is happening in my members communities what are the things that they might want from the association knowing that you might not know the answer within your own opinion until you're on your own journey so i often like to make parallels to other leaderly things that we have to do in the association space to try, and, like <laughs> to try and make this um, hopefully more accessible. And I don't know if this completely translates, but it's relevant to the moment, which is the whole premise of events and virtual events and hybrid events. We're all having to learn the best practices around those things. We're having to learn what our members can tolerate, what's of interest to them, how the culture may or may not match. And the leader in their team are having to sit around and get their arms around this. And in order to get your strategy right, you have to own it, right? You might not be the expert because you have an events person perhaps, um, and they're gonna implement all of these things. But I would say from a strategy perspective, what do, you, what do you know about your own unconscious biases? 
What do you know about how your own life has informed your lenses around this work and may or may not be um, ready to speak on this? And what do you need to do to get that support around you privately and then start to bring that to your team so that collaboratively the team is getting on the journey in order to be able to deliver the thing that your members say they need and as we know, our members don't always know how to say what they really need. <laughs> they might say they want A and they really need B, C, and D. <laughs> and you have to get your own education on to understand what B, C, and D might be, even though they're saying A. Um, and so I know that's not the um, check the box answer, but that's that to me is the answer, is that it's you're not gonna be able to check the box. I'll also say Google's wonderful. Google is wonderful and there are some books out there. There are classes out there. There are webinars out there. There's podcasts like this everywhere. Um, and there are also colleagues. I would say um, joining groups where you can talk about this with other colleagues in a safe space, um, whether that's racially specific or trans racially specific, meaning um, multiple races in one group and it's determined to be safe for everyone to talk about it or specifically your group talking about how to be better within your group or deal with the issues of the group. Um, both things are happening in the association space and in the world. I think those are also powerful ways. Um, and I know this is a long winded answer, but I'll, I'll just clarify com key components that I see in there is that relationships matter in the process of transformation and feedback matters in the process of transformation and accountability matters in the process of transformation. So there's a lot of other components, but um, I would say those are things that you'll want to start to bring around you as you go on your own journey. When you mentioned listening, you know, so much of that is dependent on the, you know, the, the soft skills on, on the component of listening. And, you know, to be fair, not everyone has been hamstrung or, or paralyzed or uncertain in this space. There's a lot of organizations oh, and associations who have been spearheading these conversations, whether they be related to race or gender um, mm -hmm. over over years and if not decades, um, or who are built specifically to address these these topics. But for those who may be uh, later to later to the discussion, later to that transition, there are best practices, there are tools and check boxes and templates yeah. to help allow someone to jumpstart this in this space and uh, and demonstrate to the board or to the membership that they're not starting from scratch. What kind of what kind of resources should an association be looking for? Where can they go? Uh, you know, in, in that get start mindset mm -hmm. um, or, or doing this right, you can't sit on the sidelines of this anymore. Um, yeah. And, uh, and how do you get started? What, what tool what do those tools look like? So I, I would say um, there's a couple of things. One is, uh, I believe one of the best practices from association leadership perspective is that um, while a lot of associations have been on this journey for quite a while, and oftentimes we in associations will say, let's go form a task force and let's have that task force go handle that thing for us. And they'll come back and tell us whether it's that they went and got membership feedback, whether they went and built some some properties, whether they started to come up with maybe a, a micro strategy. Um, I would say a, a, a best practice would be to see if you can, whether you've already been on the journey or you're starting it, see what you can do to have your board be the leaders and have it come inside of the overall organizational strategy and not a segment on the side. It's okay if you end up operationalizing it that way, but if the board doesn't own the strategy and is not on their own journey for the association around how are we as an association handling this and what do we need to do to move to the next place, whatever we see that is, um, and is the board constantly learning competencies around how to look at those lenses in every single area of the organization, not just within, I'm going to, again, kind of point to how we do an event. <laughs> it needs to be how we cultivate volunteerism. It's how we provide accessibility in our virtual meetings as well as our in-person meetings. It's, it's how we look at the premise of the makeup of the organization and the membership against the makeup of our leaders and our key volunteers. I mean, there's a lot of lenses to look at it. There's a lot of data that you can start to gather about those things. A lot of us don't have that data in our AMSs, in our, in our databases. We don't necessarily have racial or cultural or diverse types of data as part of a member profile. And that's a good place to start too, not 
necessarily the first place to start. But if you're going to be willing to maintain that data, that could be an interesting component because the data matters. I would also say, um, so if you're able to put it in the strategic plan and you're able to start to operationalize that, the team also needs the competencies to do that as well. So understanding how that feeds into every aspect of the organization and where are you on the journey as an organization. So let's pretend they're starting and they started at basically legal compliance. <laughs> they're just doing what's mandated by the law. And I would say the far end of that spectrum is being an overt, open, proactive leader and really saying that we as an organization believe in this and we do this and we model those best practices in full and then there's a spectrum along the way um and taking i think i think one of the things that members um have allowed us in this pandemic moment in particular even though they might be expecting more of us culturally and socially they are also i think giving us grace i think they're they're saying you know what they're trying <laughs> They're not necessarily getting it perfect. And we're all in part two of this whole transition as we go into year two of the pandemic. And I think being able to um, make uh, strides that you can communicate to your members around, we're doing this, we're, we're extroverting this, um, we're watching our language, we believe in visibility, we believe in providing opportunity, we believe in getting proactive. Um, we understand that our impact matters more than our intent. We understand that um, our beliefs and our actions need to align, that our mission and our vision and our strategy need to align with those values. We need to model that for the businesses and the people that we represent. And we want to, we will not build it for you without you. And that's saying to all of the communities that you may not fairly represent yet. We always have communities that we could always build better on, whether it's young professionals, people of color, LGBTQ, don't build for them without them. So make sure you're doing things to bring them to the table to be able to figure out how can we serve you better. Yeah. Well, you know, and you said, you said something that really struck me, impact matters more than intent. And I think for so long and in a lot of areas, organizations may have been getting credit for their, for their, their good intentions. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talk about accountability and measurables. What does that look like in this, in this conversation? What, what are you measuring? What as an executive, are you ready to be held accountable for? And what are you communicating to your membership as the, the deliverables here? Is this just about a head count and adding some, you know, I'm just afraid that people are going to check the boxes and stick some people in different places on the board or, hey, now yeah. you're on this task force so that they can check the box and see, oh, see now, see now we have people who look different than us. Look, we, we're done. We're done. And I just, what are the real measurables here that an organ, uh, intangible or tangible, Yeah. You know, what, I, what are we really trying to, to measure and, and then communicate? So one of the things that I think... <clears throat> I have a lot of answers to that. First of all, I, I know, think you I'm sorry, that was 10 No, that's okay. One. Let's do it. And and like hold me accountable if I'm missing, you know, one of the questions you've asked as I start to wander through this, but I would say a couple things. One, the traditional phrase for this work is diversity, equity and inclusion, which I find not all encompassing because I think at the end of the day, one, I think what associations are really good at and in this area not maybe as good at as a whole and we're working towards it is creating belonging for everyone. So that to me is part of what you would want to find a way to get feedback and qualitative data around is how are we creating a space for the people we want to belong, belong, right? How do they feel about the way we treat them in the organization? And so those are challenging ways to get at the, like that that's not an easy thing to measure that's right not a feelings scale and belonging, belonging. The, yes how do you measure but I can, this is psychology how do we it, it is psychology and i i feel and look we might all feel on this call uh you need a good partner <laughs> who is external to the organization in my opinion to be helping you on that journey privately as the leader from behind the scenes and absolutely overtly in front of the board and the staff as well it, it, how could you possibly get it right without expertise guiding you from the seat that you sit in for the specifics of the organization that you're in and the specifics of the industries you serve? 
I, I, I don't know another way to do it. And, um, and so to your point about you can't check the box and there's going to be some boxes you want to check, right? So you don't just put people in positions and say, looky here, <laughs> we're diverse, look at that. All right, so how are you creating equity? Do you even know what that means? Do you know the difference between equity and um, equal? Because they are not the same, right? Do you know the difference between what it feels like to be included? I think one of the things, um, I worked in a trade and um, traditionally in trades, um, you have a lot of white men, and then they're now bringing in more women, but it's not necessarily culturally diverse or not necessarily in the Americas. I, I don't, you know, but it's not necessarily culturally diverse and it's not necessarily age diverse either. Those are the two areas that I feel like they're talking about a lot. And um, what I found is that for people who have always felt belonging, who have always felt included, who maybe always felt a really easy trip to the top, and easy is a relative term, I get it's not implying that no one works hard for it, but um, they don't know what it like, what do you mean you don't feel you belong? What do you mean you're not in, like you're sitting right here? I brought you in. <laughs> what so what is the organization doing to make it accessible for the experience of that leader's voice, which will be different? It will be unique compared to some of the others? How is it being included and supported? And I think that's where you start to get into the competencies of those in the room and go, how are they allying for that other person or for those other communities? And I, I don't want to jump here, but one of those best practices is starting to understand we all have a sense of privilege in terms of boxes we can check, right? So um, I am a biracial Black woman that has me in a lot of boxes with no privilege, but I also identify as cisgendered. I also identify as heterosexual. I, those are privilege boxes. And so how am I wielding my privilege that I don't even think about all day long, the way people who can't walk down the street and hold the hand of the, their partner and feel safe? So how am I wielding my privilege to provide that safety for those communities? What am I doing? And frankly, it, it requires us to make those issues our own and then stand in the gap and do that. And the associations will need to do that. Association leaders will need to do that, but you wouldn't know how to do that unless you had gone down a journey of competency and learning and understanding some of those blind spots around our own privilege, our own bias. We all have it. I'm on this journey too. <laughs> I think I think we're all on this journey. And so I would say that, um, um, the one of the first things you're going to want to do is give it a shot, go start from somewhere, but um, be willing to make mistakes and clean it up. So back to your point on impact. It's often a best practice when you start a meeting that's going to have sensitive topics, DEI or otherwise, that you come up with some ground rules, right? You would say, okay, so today, you know, let's come up with some ground rules that keep everyone safe in the room. We're not going to record this session. We're going to, and a lot of them over all the years I've ever known until recent years, it said, assume positive intent. <laughs> and I would say that's where I would go, okay, I I'm willing to assume positive intent if we will also agree to talk about the impact of the action. And then when you have those conversations and go, I'm assuming positive intent here, but I need to share the impact of that action had X, Y, and Z for me in my experience. And then you start to experience what it means to have a little bit of forgiveness, a little bit of reconciliation and course correction, and fundamentally some accountability for a different impact. And that's a powerful learning opportunity that we sometimes as associations will need to model in front of our members. So if we're willing to hear the impact of our actions that the members are feeling that we may be unconsciously delivered to them and wanna to continue to correct and wanna check on as we move forward, then we're willing to say, oh, we didn't mean to have that impact. We're willing to shift gears. Here's how we're doing it differently. Here are the voices we've brought to the table to help us get it right. And we're gonna try again. And, and that's what we would do in a membership model. It's what we would do with a new event strategy. It's what we would do around community building. So um, I'm gonna pause there because it looks like we've got some excitement around this one. <laughs> Andrew, are you are you ready? Well, no, yeah, no, it's just, it's just yeah, sorry. It's just, I mean, uh, I don't, we don't want to go on and on. I want to make sure as, you have an opportunity to uh, to chime in. Just as you were talking there, I'm thinking, you know, 
I think the I think the sector the the you know if we t you know the membership sector is both blessed but cursed by its own perception of its purpose, and I think a lot of times the discussions around uh, inclusivity are limited in their perspective to, well, we're about the profession. We're not about who makes up that comp that profession. And we're about, the, we, we just focused on the, uh, the, the role of, of, I'm simplifying this, but the role of supporting individuals who work in a professional context, irrespective of their cultural uh, backgrounds or their uh, gender or their race. Um, and I think that's used sometimes as an excuse. Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not justifying. I think they use mm -hmm. that. I mean, how many times have I been asked to write us a policy and write it in the context of uh, the Equalities Act? And because in the UK it's the Equalities Act 2010, which is what we use, and there are protected characteristics. And then I had a caveat at the end of that statement, Andrew, that says, "But really, we're focused on the professional, the diversity of professional expertise, and that's what we really. That's what that's what really makes you know enhances our members' sense of belonging." And I think it's. I think people just use it to, uh, as a, as a as a smokescreen, you know. So actually, we don't have to. We we put this catch all. It's like a job description when you put in all the things people are gonna do, and then say, and any other duty commensurate with the role, you know. It's like you know, and then we'll just throw everything at you. And I, I feel a lot of the time that we're hiding behind the pretense of of um, well, you know, it doesn't really matter who you are, where you're from, as long as, or, and, and what your worldview and world experience is, just as long as you're working in this profession, that's all we care about, and that's all we're going to focus on. And, and, and actually, it's interesting, as you're talking, I'm, I'm seeing the link, I'm seeing it, it may be, it may be, um, um, it may not be apparent, but, you know, we spend a lot of time talking with organisations about broader social responsibility issues and sustainability and climate change etc and i spend a lot of time advocating the role of associations in civic society not just in terms of its professional context and and I, we spend and, and a lot of the time people push back and say oh well that's that's not us we don't need to worry about that let other people worry about that we're just going to focus on what we do best which is professional expertise rather than my professional life and the, and the context in which I work and who I am and all the different experiences I have or, and, or don't have as a result of who I am and where I'm from. And I see a lot of synergy in the conversations that we're having. Um, and I think the, the key for me, the focal, quite, the focal point is associations needing to wake up and realise the civil, the civic role they have to play uh, and the civic responsibility they need to realise. And, and, quite frankly, at the moment, is an unwillingness to realise that responsibility. For whatever the reasons are, ignorance, arrogance, inexperience, whatever it is, um, point blank refusal to deal with reality, I just think, um, yeah, I just feel that there's a whole, there's a, this is part of a more fundamental question about the purpose of the association world. I don't know if that resonates with you. I don't know if I'm if if you're if you're seeing that link, but certainly it's one that sort of I think until we address that question around purpose, we'll struggle with so many other uh, questions. But to Sharon's point, it comes down to the people behind it all. Purpose of the organization elevates beyond those individual choices, the individual journey. And what I'm seeing as I'm working with boards and doing strategic planning and and working with with the leaders that are in place now is they're in a protectionist position. They almost see this as a zero sum game, as if whatever they they as if they have to give something away, that they will lose something by bringing others to the table. And that's what breaks my heart is that there is they feel like others equity others access others inclusion is at their own expense or is encroaching upon their own mm -hmm. but then is that and, one is that not what i'm talking about is that not is that are we not saying the same thing here when i say people are hiding behind this I, when yeah, you belong think, because you belong to a profession therefore yeah. forget the rest of it that's up to everyone else to handle i'm just thinking of the individual leader who thinks well my i want my 
chairmanship to be like this in a couple years and if more people are coming in am i competing against more you know people are thinking about it in terms of their own personal experience and they i see many many leaders who are in this protectionist stance and it's not that they don't believe in these bigger purpose this the bigger issues they just don't want it on on their on the, but you know, they don't want the responsibility for it they that's don't want the, the responsibility the and they don't want it to take away from their you know what they've carved out for themselves you know those privileged see the the issuance of of opportunity to others as a threat to their own privilege that's what i see around around the board table i also yes i agree with both of those perspectives and i think that it has everything to do with personally, that they're basically saying, I'm scared to do. And that's why I say at the end of the day, in order to do it well for your organization, you need the competency as an individual to know how to go about this work. Otherwise, what? how are you going to possibly be able to have a vision of what's possible for the organization? And it's a very easy cop out to say, that's just not what we do. Because I would say, I would say to, you know, to, to kind of merge both of those points that, um, well, I'll put it this way, I would be curious as to the demographic boxes those people can check. And I would, I would ask questions around that, because do you think that the profession that you serve just doesn't have people who are different from you and therefore had a similar path towards their success? Do you even see those who are maybe getting their resources from somewhere else because they don't feel welcome to the table anyway? I mean, I think one of the things that is be hopefully becoming more visible in the world, kind of stepping back from associations, is that um, marginalized communities continue to find a way to take care of their own. And it somehow is very invisible to those who are not in the community. So it looks like sometimes those communities don't exist. It looks like they don't have expertise. There's all these kind of perceptions from outside of those communities that, well, they're not even doing it anyway. So, I mean, they're not missing anything. We're not missing anything. If they wanna come to us, they'll knock on the door and we'll open it. I just don't think that's true. Right. That's just not that's not absolutely not how the world is functioning. And so um, not to get too colloquial with it, but I actually think that's. This is not the definition. I've not Googled this, but, you know, the term woke is there for a reason. It's like people are waking up. It's not what you think it is. <laughs> the matrix is not built the way you think it is. And so if you if you're not part of right, if you're not part of some of those communities and seeing it from the other perspective, which is. Um, a large population on this planet, even though you might perceive it as just them, they, those over there, um, you're not only missing a business opportunity, <laughs> you're missing a significant, promise you there's ROI behind this, if you need the dispassionate perspective, um, you're, you're, not, you're not being a good steward of your association, in my perspective. I think that's a, at the end of the day, that's a stewardship and foresight problem. So I, I think it comes point, right down to those core it. competencies. Yeah, go you ahead. You don't just build it waiting for them to come knock on the door. No. This isn't about just having no. something to for people to pull from. You have to push. You have to push something out. You have to go and and reach. You have to reach beyond your comfort zone, beyond what you've done before. Um, you know, and I don't know if it's meeting meeting them where they are or even beyond that. Well, and I, you know, I, I have to also say, like, at the end of the day, how are, why are we disputing the premise of helping people feel welcome at the table? Why are we having that? Why is that a discussion? Why are we thinking that that's a threat? What, like, right. that's where and I that get my, curious, yeah, that's right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, let's, you know, when a leader says those things to us, I would dig right into that conversation. And that requires some skill for sure. But what is going on around the thought, like help, Tell me the narrative that you've got around that, right? What's the story that maybe you're making up, but maybe not, maybe it's happened to you, maybe you feel like it's happened to you, but what, what's what got you in that position? And I think at the end of the day, it's fear and it's not necessarily based on reality. And so let's talk about that fear and let's get you from that place. Cause that's not a leaderly position to come from period. 
we don't no. we shouldn't be leading from a position of fear or creating policy or strategy from yeah. that place yeah and i think that points a lot to the a lot of the other sort of issues that we have to explore with boards uh we spend a lot of time talking to boards who are incapable of working in an honesty based environment they there is no honesty based governance because there's no trust in the in the boardroom a lot of the time not just around uh questions of uh diversity and inclusivity and equality just generally you know there are a whole number of um issues around how boards are working or or not uh together you know functioning you know at that most senior leadership level and yeah again you know it's it's that it's that piece isn't it it's like i don't want to you we were talking earlier on about you know where we don't want to talk about it in the abstract i don't want to talk about um dei in the abstract i only want yeah. to talk about the organization in the whole and yeah mm -hmm. i worry that if i still struggle to understand how to how to talk about it in the whole without without first talking about it as though it's this kind of standalone issue and it's not and it's not stand you know DEI is not a standalone issue it's about look we're just talking about the the sustainability of our organization in in the round we're talking about everybody who should be in it so i again I'm, you know it's, it's about who do we work with first do we do or how do we work rather with the board because that's with the organization's leadership the board gets its delegated authority from the membership it is the board that has to take direct leadership um from the top um although i believe strongly that all of these these questions about the um uh, about the the success and the sustainability of the organization must be driven from the bottom as well because you can't talk again you can't ignore with the membership but uh, you know, is it is it a case of well, actually, we need to focus. You know, if we have, you know, do we focus first and foremost on the board of directors, on our council, on our executive? Is that where we is that where we first of all focus our efforts, or do we say, let's fo let's talk, let's get the mem let's get this driven from the membership? Yeah, I um, there's a couple of ways to do it. I would say somewhat depends on the history of the organization and the industry they serve. I think. It could go a couple of ways. I would say the leader needs to get some support to get into a conversation with the board. And um, I would say a conversation with the board could easily turn into, we're gonna have a deep dive and a meeting solely focused on this topic, right? And to be able to really get at wh where do we think we are, what's possible around where we wanna go, and what are the steps we'd like to take to get there? It's not. It, it absolutely breaks down into the traditional planning process. It's just that you will constantly, you know, one of the principles of transformation is that we as humans will always want to go back to homeostasis. We will always want to revert back to that old muscle memory. And the whole point of this work is that you're building new muscles. You're opening your eyes differently. And everywhere you turn, there'll be more things to open your eyes. You will, you will find that it exhausts you. And then you got to take a break because you got to keep going. You can't not do the work. It will hurt. It will exhaust you. It will be, it will be challenging. And hopefully that's the glory is because of what you're creating is not only the right thing, not only um, going to grow the association, there will be ROI, but frankly, do you want to be the association not doing this in the next five years? <laughs> a lot of associations will say, well, I can maybe get away with it. I don't know, but I would like to think that no one really thinks they can literally get away with it and that they'll somehow see the value of getting on the journey. And it could easily take an association, you know, two, three to five years to make deep impact. But if you're demonstrating the actions and communicating the actions that the board is taking, that the staff is building, the resources that are coming, some of the differentials that have visibility to it for the membership, um, you can do that in a year. You can do that in two years. And as long as you're communicating that out well, I think the members, depending on the feedback and what's going on, can show some grace around they're doing it. They're, they're maybe doing it a little slower. They're maybe having some challenges, but I appreciate that my association 
um, I'll say it from the perspective of, say, a black woman who maybe is in a traditionally white male dominated industry. They're trying to get it right. And I'd like to think that they would welcome my voice at the table and the different perspective in which I come from, the different resources or the ways in which I fell into this profession and how my experience in this profession is different, my, my access to the education that gets me further down the path and how equitable that's provided to me and how, how much do I feel like I can belong to this organization, not just pay my dues, but really feel like my voice belongs, I belong, I'm valued and I'm seen. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing at the end of the day I'll throw out there is that we're also talking about people's dignity. Dignity is a human right that's very different than respect. Dignity is a human right. So what as an association are we doing to provide dignity to the people in the profession we represent? That might be a question, that might be a value, that might be um, something to chew on with a board. Um, because I do feel like at the end of the day, that's what this is about. And I think associations work very hard to make that an outcome for their members. What are some ways in which we might be missing that mark for some of the people that aren't at the table? Yeah. Sharon, thank you so much. This is exactly the conversation that we knew we needed to start having and start having more frequently. And you were the, the perfect voice of, of experience and perspective that, that we needed to, to engage with to do this, to do this correctly. And uh, I look forward, you know, Andrew and I to inviting more guests and, and pushing this, this more, uh, this topic forward in a more concerted and aggressive manner. Um, so thank you so much. It's, it's so big. It's so big. It is, it is scary for those who don't have that education or haven't gone through their own journey, who don't have that, that, uh, I don't know, that, that hunger, that, that willingness to, to go through the work. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy for any person, for any organization. And uh, I just so thank you for, for opening our eyes, for, for kicking this off in, uh, in the right way. We, we greatly appreciate it and hope to have you back as you work with more organizations, as, as we address this topic with more organizations, we, we'd love to have you back in the future and, and greatly appreciate your time. Um, until next time, um, you know, please do, whether it be Google, you know, to Sharon's point, Google is your friend, start somewhere. Talk to those organizations that you know are already undertaking this. Um, you know, I know at uh, the Institute of Association Leadership, these conversations are happening all the time um, in some of the online communities. Um, you know, there are safe places for organ for association executives to talk about this um, and to figure out how it can be um, approached in in your environment for your profession for your organization. So, um, progress over perfection and. Uh, and do join us again on association transformation as we as we take on this topic um, again, along with all of the other, all the rest uh, that that association executives juggle um, with their boards on uh, on a daily basis. So thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find association transformation wherever you get your podcasts, and we hope you'll make us one of your favorites. Andrew, thank you for uh, for being there and providing your perspective today. Greatly appreciated. As much as I beat you up a little bit. I appreciate uh, you. I'm saying it here on the record. I appreciate you. Thank Don't you. get okay. Let's we we will never speak of this again. Just <laughs> let it go. <laughs> um, but again, thank you, everyone. Um, if you have any ideas or a guest or uh, would like to join us yourself, you can tweet us at Association Transformation or uh, email us hello at yourconsort.com. And until next time, we say uh, stay well and put your members and your mission first. Association Transformation is brought to you in partnership between Consult Strategy and Brewer Pratt Solutions in support of the Institute of Association Leadership.